Welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to have you all here. I would like to start by welcoming you to tonight's Conversation Cafe. It's a program series that invites exhibiting artists at the Fitchburg Art Museum to discuss their work. And tonight we are honored to have Abelardo Morel as our featured guest. I'm Lauren Zumita. I'm the curator at the Fitchburg Art Museum. And I would really like to thank you all for being here because this was originally intended as an in-person event. And I know that Zoom fatigue is real, so I appreciate that you all carved out the time to be here. But we are incredibly fortunate to be here with the esteemed Abelardo Morel. So Abe, I would like to especially thank you for being here and sharing your wisdom and the insights that you've gained over your fruitful career. I would like to mention at the outset that we are recording this event and it will be pub publicly available after tonight's program. Um, I'm gonna give some very brief remarks because you're not here to listen to me and then I will turn it over to Abe. And after his presentation, we'll have some time for a Q&A. And I really encourage you to use this opportunity to ask your burning questions because this is a really special opportunity to interact with the artist and Abe is very generous with his time and his questions. So for those of you who might be less familiar with Abe Morel, um, he was born in Cuba. He's currently based in Boston and is celebrated internationally. He received his bachelor's degree from Bowdoin College and his MFA from the Yale University School of Art. He has received a number of prestigious awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1994, an Infinity Award from the International Center of Photography in 2011, and a Lucy Award for Achievement in Fine Art in 2017. His work has been collected internationally and by some of the largest museums in the area. The Museum of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, the Metropolitan, the Chicago Art Institute, and the Boston Museum of Fine Art, among others. But as impressive as these facts or these statistics are, they sum up his career in a way that I believe don't really capture what he's truly achieved. An artist who followed his curiosity, explored the potential of his medium, and ended up making an indelible and remarkable impression on the field of fine art photography. Abe is best known for his work with the camera obscura and his contemporary engagement with a technology that predates the camera and modern photography. But he has done so much more than that, and I think we'll hear a little more on that tonight. But the exhibition at the Fitchburg Art Museum, Abelardo Morel, Projecting Italy, features camera obscura and tent camera images of sites in Italy. The exhibition is supported in part by a generous grant from the Amelia V. Gallucci Serio Endowment, Center for Italian Culture at Fitchburg State University. It's on view until January 2nd, so I hope that you'll hope that you'll all have a chance to visit the exhibition. And at long last, I am honored to, to present Abelardo Morel tonight. Welcome, Abe. Thank you, Lauren. It's a, a pleasure to be here. And I'm uh, delighted that uh, some people came and that the show is still being seen. So thank you. Thank you for showing up. No, I'm a good photographer, but not a good technical person. So share screen. All right, can you see that? Okay, so. Um, so uh, I'm going to go back a little bit in, 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 in history and physics to show um, some of the paths that I've taken to get the, uh, a lot of my work done. In, after my, our son Brady was born in 86, I made a lot of uh, children's pictures, uh, but I began to think about optics in, in not in sophisticated ways, but very rudimentary optics, like my glasses, uh, what happens underwater with light bending, or how a glass of wine can become a kind of a very crude lens, a lens not nonetheless. Uh, so these fascinations with, with optics, um, uh, everyday optics, 
began to sort of inform other ideas about optics by, and this is not a very good picture per se, but it's the experiments I was doing in 1990, 91 with uh, uh, a lens and then my hand being seen through it, just primitive, but fun. Um, okay, so in, in I, I started teaching at Mass College of Art in, in 1983, and uh, in the late uh, 80s, I wanted to show students something about, you know, the magic of photography, the, uh, the unusual perfection that it came with, and, um, and I made this picture in 1991 hoping to, to begin to show my students uh, the, how beautiful and primitive uh, photography could be. So this is an experiment showing how a light bulb on the right enters a dark box with uh, an enlarging lens in this case. But I love the idea that it's um, not a very sophisticated picture, but it shows the, the perfection of the light bulb inside. And I loved it a lot. Um, which led me to, in 1991, to begin, actually, no, in the late 80s, I began to turn uh, classrooms, my classrooms into camera obscuras. And essentially that's a room that's been darkened somehow. Um, and uh, with a hole looking out, outside. That's as simple as it gets. And for some reason, the physics and the optics of creation led to those circumstances to allow whatever is happening outside to be formed as an image inside. It just, it came with a place. Nobody invented it. It's just, it's been around forever. And so I started exploring the idea of turning my classrooms into camera obscuras where students could see Huntington Avenue upside down um, crudely, but still effectively. And uh, it was, I mean, very savvy, cynical kids. Uh, the usual response was, uh, oh my God, you know? And, and I, so I knew I was onto something showing uh, this really primitive ancient device. Um, and before I go to the devices, uh, that same thing, um, a, an event happening in the sky, um, going through leaves and branches so that they become small openings in a way, allows that event to be seen on the ground. In this case, it's a solar event, a solar eclipse that is actually being pictured on the ground itself. So this is a, just a photograph of the ground during a solar eclipse that's been formed by small openings. Um, and it's just amazing. It, Aristotle 300 BC talks about this, like what is this? And he, he tries to make sense of it, but it's, so it's an ancient knowledge that we're dealing with. Um, also when branches and leaves crisscross each other, uh, the perfect image of a sun gets uh, shown and it, it happens all the time. You, you've been in a picnic in Italy one, one, you know, someday, right? And uh, this is happening. So it's, it's been with us for a long time, even outside. Uh, Van Gogh uh, made gorgeous uh, paintings uh, exactly with that kind of light with pinholes are uh, showing the sun scatter all over his paintings. In 1991, I began to try to make a picture of a camera obscura and it took, it took a, a couple months to figure out the techniques. You know, uh, this is a hole looking out into the, our living room in Quincy. And this is what came in. Making the picture was not so easy because they had to figure out how long the exposures were. 
and at the end they were about eight hours long. Uh, film is very slow, and uh, so this is the first one I made. And as far as and I know, um, no one had made a picture like this before. I mean, pinhole cameras existed, but the idea of photographing the event of a camera obscura in a room um, happened in 1991. Then I went to New York. Uh, this is still uh, a, a small opening looking out. So this is an eight hour exposure of the Empire State Building. And think of it, I mean, with, I live in Boston, so I had someone uh, tell me a friend of a friend of a friend who said, oh, this guy's uh, apartment looks onto the Empire State Building. So I made the picture started the exposure at uh, 8 a.m. I was finished by four. I came back into the room, stopped the camera, packed up, put the, the sheet, one sheet of film in a box, took Amtrak back to Boston, got home uh, pretty late and uh, went to my dark room. I developed the sheet of film and it came out. <laughs> so extremely primitive and time consuming. This is uh, my father on the left, no longer with us, but some apartments that I found really require a lot of darkening. Oh, that's that. Yeah, and this is what came out of that picture. This is where Fox Talbot uh, basically invented photography. So this is his uh, Abbey. Some Italian pictures because the show that I'm in, in right now is really Italian works. Um, Umbria, Flor outside of Florence. Now I have to tell you that many uh, technical developments have occurred from 1991 to later. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, have the pictures be sharper. So I investigated ways into having special lenses be, be made for me that instead of a hole, would it would replace the hole and would project a lot more sharp images. Uh, and then I also found a way to turn the images upside, uh, right side up through optics. So, and, and color, of course. So lots of changes happened. Um, and not all the pictures are right side up because sometimes it looks better uh, uh, upside down. Like in Rome. Or Venice. I got an invitation 2006 from a collector who lived in London, but has also has a palazzo in the Grand Canal. And he said, uh, essentially, if I bring you out here, pay for your family to be here and, you know, everything. Uh, could you make a picture like yours inside my mother's bedroom? And of course, yeah, Venice, yeah, sure. Um, so I was still shooting film at the time. So it required, uh, you know, you know, an eight by 10 camera and a four by five camera. Um, and so this is the picture that came out with a lens that made it quite sharp, but it was still a five hour exposure. And in 2007, I went back and I, the Salute, this, this church was being fixed. So it's a whole different look. I was disappointed, but you know, things change. Um, and while in Venice, I, and this is a kind of Leto painting, uh, my host said, you know, I know someone who lives in that, in that office. And he was actually talking, talking to me uh, while pointing to a kind of Leto painting. <laughs> I, we know, he knows um, um, this guy who, who's got a great view uh, and he's right in that office. And we found it. <laughs> and uh, from that man's office, I'm sure Canaletto 
the painter made this painting of the Piazzetta. And, uh, and this is the picture I made. So that's my, my photograph, uh, it's still film, <clears throat> but uh, I kind of uh, an amazing kind of feel of uh, an area that was just crowded with thousands and thousands of tourists, um, eerily uh, deserted. This is also in Venice and right side up uh, with the Grand Canal in blue there. And we're also seeing houses across the canal. Uh, this woman who is Colombian um, decorated her whole palazzo with Colombian uh, jungle themes, which, you know, it, who needs surrealism when this stuff is in front of you? And I just love the mix up of surfaces and ideas and uh, meanings. In um, a later stage, uh, someone asked me to make some pictures like mine, the camera obscura pictures in Texas, in the, the, the desert in Texas. And I, I said, well, I, you know, I need a room and there are no rooms in the desert. So I thought about inventing through this earlier rendition of an artist using a kind of a tent with a periscope that allowed people to see whatever was nearby projected right on his uh, pad. It was a way to draw the world before photography. Uh, it was known, a lot of people were doing it. Some people still think that it was done much earlier, but anyway, so I thought about this and then I investigated ways to make my own portable camera obscure. And it's, it's a, this is a simple schematic, but the idea is that a tripod holding a periscope sticks out of the top, looks at something in the landscape and that image gets projected right on the ground. So while I'm inside with my assistant, we could see the trees on the surface of the ground. And what's interesting though, is that surfaces change. It could be sandy, uh, muddy, concrete, uh, leafy. Uh, so every, every situation has its own patina. And then I made a picture of that. This is a, an early, I think one of the early ones we did in the desert. And, um, and this is my assistant, CJ Heiliger, who is actually quite an accomplished photographer now. But it, it, was, it was hard work. Um, so once uh, the thing was set up, uh, I was looking at a particular site here in the desert. And, and this is the picture that came out. So we're seeing the marriage of the dry ground, desert ground with an image of nearby mountains. And this combination of uh, densities, I, I, I love it. It was like, oh, this is like a new thing, you know? Um, and it's real, it's not some Photoshop bullshit. This is not mine, uh, William Henry Jackson, the er photographer who photographed uh, the, one of the early discoveries of in Yellowstone of the geyser, all faithful. Uh, I wanted to do a picture of this. So I got permission from the park rangers and uh, set up my tent uh, to, to capture that moment. And uh, this is the, the image. And I just love the idea that you know, there are a billion pictures of that geyser, but somehow through this device, this roundabout way of looking at something with this device shows you 
a kind of a different reality and a new new reality. It makes you sort of appreciate the thing. This is in Maine, uh, just April. There's still some ice and dead grass. But the result, it was quite painful. Um, and at this point, uh, I'm, I'm not using film. Uh, I've begun to use a digital ca uh, camera, digital back, which can make the exposures from eight hours um, to one minute, two minutes. So in this case, a moment in time, like shadows and you know light uh, shapes are captured fairly fast. Grand Canyon. This is an homage to Ansel Adams Cathedral. Yellowstone in the winter. Total change here. This is uh, in Florence. And uh, it was pretty freaky because people were like wondering what the hell we were doing. Uh, we had permission, by the way, so it's not like you can just do this. There were some cops behind me. So that uh, tent I placed there because I wanted to photograph this incredible uh, building. Brunelleschi in the 1400s used this building to demonstrate um, perspective in, in art. And from that moment on, art changed. Things were now being pictured with the space that we're used to seeing now, the uh, things, uh, perspective, changing the distance of things, the, the, the look of things. But so I wanted to make that, this picture in homage to Brunelleschi and to talk about uh, an optical moment. I took my tent to Monet's garden in Giverny. This is my assistant, Matt. Uh, and I, I, all that was available for me to put my tent on were this uh, pebbly uh, uh, roadways and passages. So uh, Monet's garden with this tent camera became impressionistic, became a kind of uh, Monet painting itself. Uh, and this is this is what you could inside the tent. Um, Matt and I would look at it and see that woman, a farmer, doing stuff, or see that um, wheelbarrow at six in the morning. But you know, think about it. If Bonet had come out of his house, I would have said, "You want to see one of your paintings on the ground." Uh, and it's truly what's happening here. It's quite naturally made, uh, but uh, in some ways so transforming. This is more in Monet's garden and then other parts of France in uh, Normandy where he, he painted. This is a picture of a, in his garden of a farmer, uh, a, a gardener, sorry. He stood there for the two minutes that we requ were required to make the picture. And the patina and the, the surface, uh, shimmering surface uh, moments that this uh, thing allows, remind me so much of uh, painting. I mean, this is a Corot painting. Um, if I've never seen one, it's just, uh, it, it as a, for photography meets painting through a very interesting uh, dark space. This is a painting actually by Monet that's at the MFA in Boston. And a friend, a, a guide who was helping us at the time, um, we didn't know how to find it. He said, oh no, I, I think I know the spot. And we drove around for a while on the coast of Normandy and set up by tent and uh, and so this is the my picture of it, which was pretty much 
the same view that he had. I also went to England because um, I'm a big fan of Constable, the painter. Um, this is one of his most famous paintings, the Hay Wayne. Uh, so we drove to the area where he made a lot of his paintings and I wanted to look for this area. So, and specifically that, that part of the painting and that part. And this is my picture of the Hay Wayne. So it's fascinated by how painters make things, but also following on their footsteps to uh, not imitate exactly or copy, but in the spirit of their paintings. So this is a photograph, my photograph. Another constable, I mean, my constable, sorry. Going to Italy now. So uh, this is from Florence, uh, 2017. Uh, and I love this picture because it, the painting that's on the wall there takes on a kind of a shimmering, uh, weird light on it. And it's the camera obscure projection is making it bright. This is my tent has changed different formats now, but um, this is overlooking Florence. And that's the picture. Um, I've used, obviously, I've made camera obscures a lot, uh, a lot fewer these days. I'm on to something else, but. I wanted to show you Four Seasons Central Park from this, from the hub of this apartment in uh, Central Park South. The summer. This is now spring. Summer. Fall. I don't know how to say the next one. The, um, one of the pleasures of, of doing camera obscure work or 10 camera pictures is that I could uh, naturally put layers together, put one thing against another um, and, and create sort of unexpectedly interesting relationships. Um, this is a camera obscura that's in the show and it's the great, great place, uh, but it has so many complications. The idea of Hercules, the paint, uh, Hercules, the, the hero being painted. So, the, but the combination of the Duomo and part of the neighborhood coming into uh, the, the frescoes here, I love the layering. Well, here's a close up of it. This idea of uh, making surfaces come alive by kind of a, a weird marriage is what I love doing. So uh, I've been working on paint for three months. I've always wanted to be a painter. And so what I'm doing now is not exactly painting, but photographing paint. So I'm doing, um, I'm putting paint on surfaces, lighting them very intensely from the side, uh, photographing them with a strobe so that the, the wetness of the paint is still there. Things that a real painting can never have. So I'm, I'm, I'm using photographic techniques to deal with paint. <clears throat> I'm not gonna call myself a painter, I'm too shy about that, but 
the it's like the hybrid of the two things. So I'll show you two or three new ones. So this is two expo uh, two exposures. I mean, I made a, I made this painting. Believe me, it's not it's not very interesting. The photograph of it is interesting. Um, so I made one exposure of a detail of my wet paint, then took another detail with wet paint and combined them together. And what you get is this weird. It's like things are flowing to one another, but it's not exactly, you don't know exactly how it's going. This is also two exposures where, again, I, I'm, I have no talent in painting. I can move paint around, but I love Dutch 17th century uh, floral paintings a lot. So it's a way to uh, quote from them. And, and if you look at the photograph itself, the details are really quite amazing because there's you know, no painting could have that. This is a, a new one. Um, <laughs> I don't know what to say about this. This is so weird. The two, two exposures, one, one, one image basically going horizontally then I turn it 90 degrees. So the image is going vertically. I didn't do anything to each one. I mean, I painted them, but uh, it's basically combining one horizontal and one vertical together. And the combination leads to all kinds of new geometries and weird colors. You know, when a, a green, uh, when a yellow and a, a red get together, you get some oranges. And, and these are unexpectedly interesting to me this is uh, i made that this morning uh in some ways it's sort of like the idea of uh, i love the idea of stage uh design a lot it's like for an opera that hasn't quite yet been performed thank you so much Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Abe, thank you so much for that presentation. Of course. Um, that was wonderful. I'm sorry, I was rushing it a little bit, but yeah. No worries, plenty of time. Um, I think it's really fascinating how you sort of trace how you have always kind of created these painterly effects with your photographs, and now you're creating paint paintings with your photographs. So yeah, I know. <laughs> it's really neat how you. <laughs> Kind of pushing the boundaries of you know what is a photograph and what is a painting and you're combining them in a really interesting way so yeah yeah and there are a lot of different i mean the the photographic is the lighting itself and sometimes um freezing moments where the paint is actually moving so it's not it can have ever be a final painting uh and also details that could be enlarged into other things um and uh also, I have a camera that can amazingly describe the surface. So there are all kinds of photographic aspects to, to coming up with something that looks like paint. So, okay. Fascinating. Okay, so I would like to open it up to questions. Um, you are welcome to type your questions into the chat. Um, if you look on the bottom of your screen under reactions, there's an option on there to raise your hand and that will kind of pop you up to the forefront and we can sort of make sure we maintain some some order um, that way. So I will start with a question that has come up um, in the chat, which is, I was wondering if Abelardo could speak a bit about the beautiful Walden Pond project. We saw works from a few years ago at the Concord Museum, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, if I had uh, two or three hours, I, I would have included that uh, Concord uh, show because I loved it. Uh, I, I, since college, I've always been a, a fan of Thoreau. Uh, so it was a great opportunity to 
to sort of uh, come up, try to make pictures with his philosophy, uh, which is really an amazing, the way he amazingly distilled the world into true things. So it, I, I loved it. And uh, that project also has some camera obscures, but some uh, making landscapes out of a number of exposures. It was, again, the, the way I like to invent, but I, I was very fortunate that they asked me because Thoreau is just, uh, you know, one of the great American heroes. He, uh, he did what he said, you know, he would do and uh, we're better for it. All right. Um, Helen, do you have a question you would like to ask? Yes, looking at some of the uh, work from Italy, uh, it, when you use the camera obscura and it, um, the image goes on to the furniture, sometimes that looks complex, but in some of the images, you can see the furniture quite clearly. So I'm just wondering, did you do any sort of manipulations? I'm sorry, what kind of manipulations are you talking about? Well, that's what I'm asking. Um, in some cases, when you look at the room, you can see all of the furniture in all of its detail with no imagery superimposed on it. So I'm wondering if you did any manipulations to make that happen or that was just sort of a happy accident? Uh, no, no, happy accident. I mean, when I'm making a camera obscura, I'm in the room with my assistant and we're seeing the Duomo inside the room. I mean, it's this is what my eyes see and what the camera sees. So we're basically taking a picture of this real event. And sometimes uh, where the furniture picks up a detail or two, that's, or if I don't like it, I'll just move the, the damn chair. Um, but it's sometimes there are accidents you don't notice until later, but uh, there, there are no manipulations. All, all, I mean, it's, it's not like a, <clears throat> Someone uh, a long time ago, and I was giving a talk about this, and and she, she said, uh, "Well, it seems like a lot of work. Why don't you just take a slide projector and project whatever the hell you want on the walls, and just take a picture of that?" And I was like, I almost fainted. It's like that would be that would be fucking boring, <laughs> you know. Uh, if I in my pajamas, I can just put the Taj Mahal in Boston. That's not interesting, but when you see, when you work really hard to set up the situation and you open the lens and you see this glorious city uh, on, on the wallpaper, it, it's, it's what keeps me interested. But uh, I hope I answer your question. Yes, thanks very much. It's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from Carter. Hi. Uh, first off, thank you so much for talking tonight. I've been a fan of your work for quite some time, so I really appreciate that. Um, I was wondering what exactly you look for in a lens um, and how that can affect your work and if you have any experience in actual lens making. I wish. Uh, no, it's, um, it's, it's, it's quite a hard thing to do and you have to have a lot of equipment. So I just I just pay through the nose, <laughs> um, but I've you know I've done a lot of research into the physics of things, and I've figured out uh, you know that a certain uh, power in a lens can focus uh, an image twelve feet away, and so on. So you can get twenty five feet, thirty five, six. I have about a dozen of these lenses that have had ground so that the, uh, the image is fairly sharp um, on the wall. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's helped me you know, a lot. I mean, one of the things that um, has also transformed the work is from film to a digital back, with film, the exposures were five to eight hours long. So all the skies and all the light in the landscape remain fairly dull because over so many hours, you don't get a, a moment in, in, in light. 
with my digital camera, I can do an exposure in two or three minutes. So the sense of a moment, a cloud passing by, or even some people standing by shows up. And I love that the capturing of, uh, you know, like impressionism, a moment in time, and, uh, uh, and it makes a difference. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rebecca asks, are your paintings inspired by your time in Italy? They are amazing. You never cease to surprise. Thank you. Well, any anytime you, you, you go to Italy, you just walk into a, a church and, oh my God, that's a Caravaggio. No, I mean, uh, some of the best paintings ever made uh, have been made in Italy. So uh, I've always been a, a lover of painter, painting. I mean, uh, it's it's one of the first things I almost do when I go into a museum because I love seeing what happens on that surface with the paint and the shininess and all that. So uh, I'm just a closeted painter, I guess. <laughs> a different Rebecca asks, how do your long exposure photographs come out so crisp when the light and color and shadows must be changing over the course of the day? Well, the crispness uh, has to do with, um, if I'm photographing a building that's coming in, the building, unless there's an earthquake, the building is gonna stay put. So that's why it's sharp. It's light, light changes, of course, but the object that it's shining on remains uh, put. Uh, so that's, that's the reality. It's just, it, it shows up very, but if there was an earthquake during an exposure, hmm, I don't think I want to see that, but uh, uh, stay tuned. All right, a question from Andrea. Do you do your own printing? If not, how closely do you oversee the printing of your work and do you always use the same printer? The same man or woman or? Uh, okay, uh, my, my uh, assistant is Max Lavelle, a, a graduate of Mass Art, and he's just the best. And he knows how to work by super, super complicated um, digital camera. It's got 150 megapixels and you need a, a degree in physics or something, you know? So he knows all that stuff, but he's a great printer. So we work together and we make it, like the picture I just ended up with, we made that this afternoon, actually. And when I, I said, yeah, let's make a print. And he would make a proof and then just to red. Yeah, so we work together. Um, and it's so much fun to, to think of something, make a picture with him and see a print that's hanging in my studio now. I mean, it doesn't get better. All right, Mia and Caitlin, would you like to ask your question? Hi, yeah, um, I'm actually in my first photography class right now. Um, and I was just wondering if you have any advice for beginning photographers. Uh, uh, is that your dog? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay. So it's, you are studying photography, not your dog, right? No. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. Um, well, you know, everybody's different. So, uh, but I'm pretty sure that, that what, I mean, I started making pictures in 1969. And this afternoon I made something I've never made before. I, I think curiosity really goes a long way and not give up, you know, when stuff doesn't work. Um, I mean, being interested in the world is super important. And, um, and you know, work hard. Um, but don't expect, I mean, uh, I have a 30 year old daughter, a 35 year old son, and oftentimes they go, oh, I want it to happen really right away. And, uh, it didn't work. And, you know, it's just, you really have to sort of commit. I mean, ultimately what photography is or art is, is you putting your soul on some surface. And so figure it out what that thing is in you that uh, jives with how colors and shapes and lines uh, 
come together with that. That's, it's endless, you know. I mean, I've been looking at, lately, I, I was in uh, Estonia, the, the country recently, and I met some Norwegians who want me to go to Norway. Um, so I didn't know Norway was in my cards. So I've been looking at, uh, at Edward Monk, the, the Norwegian painter. He did the scream, everybody knows that one, but now I'm obsessed with going to Norway and photographing where he painted, which is extremely beautiful light. So, I, you know, suddenly I, my brain is like going really fast because I'm like, shit, I have to go to Norway. Um, not for a while, but um, so, and also don't try to be uh, too uh, professional, you know, or, or tell, let people tell you what you should be. I mean, kind of breaking the rules once in a while really does help uh, bring back some of those old memories of being a kid or something. So I don't know, I'm not sure that's helpful, but uh, keep it up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Wise words, I think. All right, lots more questions. Cindy would like to know what kind of reactions you have gotten from passerby when you have been using the tent camera. Oh, well, the one in, in uh, Yellowstone with Old Faithful, some of the tourists have gone by and say, I didn't know you could camp here. <laughs> and like, okay, no. Or in Florence, near the baptistry, people thought we were selling something. Like in, in, in Florence, there's all people selling, you know, fake Gucci bags or something. They thought we were selling something inside. And uh, um, yeah, people have curious things. And oftentimes we just invite them in. You know, you want to see something weird? And, and they go in and it's, uh, you feel like a, a, a local magician, you know? <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Um, I love the behind scenes of the tent cameras because they look like these um, like alien spaceships or otherworldly <laughs> pop down into these landscapes. So that's the yeah. <laughs> All right. Heidi wants to know, do you see this new work as a conscious move to abstraction from more representational work? How did Flowers for Lisa influence this move to paint? Also a huge fan from when I discovered you in college in the mid nineties. At Mass Art? Um, this person is a huge fan um, when okay. she discovered you oh, in see. college, but she would like to know um, whether your new work with painting is- Yeah, abstraction. Abstraction. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, for myself, and it took me a long time to get here, but I don't necessarily divide abstraction and reality too much. Um, but you know, flowers for Lisa uh, led me to begin to mix flowers with paint and uh, objects. Yeah, it was my first experiment in trying to uh, make paint an ally in my work, not pure paint. In this case, it is pure paint. But yeah, it helped a lot uh, to uh, peek in, you know, to you know, take chances and, and put some paint in and not be killed, you know, uh, but it helped a lot. Uh, abstractions, I mean, I love abstract paintings a lot. I mean, they're just so important to me. I mean, they're hugely important to me. Uh, when I was young in New York City, I um, go to MoMA all the time and those uh, abstract expressionist paintings really kill me. Because you would see the paint itself, you know, almost dripping that sense of a performance on the canvas uh, is still part of me. Um, and sort of related, somebody wants to know, um, is Van Gogh an inspiration? Because the last image seemed like it could be the corner of Van Gogh's bedroom. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a nice idea. No, Van Gogh is uh, extremely important to me. In fact, I'm planning to go uh, next summer to France uh, to maybe finish off a little bit of Monet's work, then go to the South 
uh, where Monet painted, and I'm, we're going to be making tent camera pictures and maybe other things, maybe flower paintings of mine for like a month in southern France. So yeah, he's huge. Uh, yeah, because in some ways he, I like his, the model, he sort of, he was never successful, but he really just had that soul that I was talking about. They just needed to do it. So yeah, there'll be a month of uh, the, this town or the city where he killed himself. It's near Paris, then uh, uh, Arles, and uh, we're in this sanatorium. So I'm trying to work with the Amsterdam Museum, the Van Gogh Museum now, to see if I can get into what the, the sanatorium. Uh, yes, so right on, Van Gogh, huge. Great. Rachel would like to know, are there any projects that you started on but then abandoned because you weren't satisfied with the results? Not recently, no. I mean, in, in the mid nineties, I had this dumb idea. I lived in Quincy in on a short block. The, uh, my idea, which I think is brilliant, was that I would photograph every house on that short, short, short block. I'd take a picture of the, the people who lived there and then photograph an object that they thought was interesting in their lives. So it would be this, the house, portraits of any, all the people there and then the, this important object. And I thought this is gonna be a killer. And the photographs were really stupid. They were just so bad. I, I, now I can do a good job. <laughs> On the flip side, have you had any photo accidents that ended up being a work of art? Yeah, I mean, I've had things solarized in the dark room negative solarized that are quite beautiful yeah um, um but typically i'm i'm pretty much in control all right marianne is asking do you shoot with um digital camera only others etc like hasselblad I use uh, something called a phase one camera and um, it, it has 150 megapixels and it's the greatest thing ever made. And uh, that's all I use. I mean, I haven't used the uh, film over 10 years and I love film. I mean, I loved it, but when it came, when digital got looked to look good, it was time, uh, the, the early, early period in digital prints, uh, photography was quite bad. I mean, they're awful looking things, but things have really caught up. So the digital will help. Um, thank you for that. Um, sure. The digital helps for the sharpness of, it, it really can do what the other cameras can't do. Well, I mean, if, uh, film four by five and eight by 10 cameras can be quite sharp. I mean, that's not, a, a, the issue, um, the, one of the nice thing, advantages of digital is that you can make a picture and then in Photoshop, you, you, you know, by the way, people think Photoshop means you put elephants in the sky all the time, you know, that's stupid. Right. Uh, right. With Photoshop, we can actually say, burn that part, but with more contrast, you know, I mean, impossible things with film, you can never do that. So you can be very controlled over um, the the quality of details in the picture, which I mean, I made beautiful black and white prints for a long time. I mean, a long time, and I was really good at it. But uh, lately, I've done new versions of that, some of those black and white negatives with digital, and they're the best prints I've ever made. They just because I, I can control it. So uh, anyway. And it's also it, that camera. I mean, I could have bought a, a very expensive BMW, but decided to buy a camera instead. Thank you. Thank <laughs> You're you. welcome. Tom is wondering if there's a connection between your tent camera images, the tent pinholes, and the pictorialist movement in photography. Yeah, I'm not. 
I would say I'm not a huge fan of the pictorialist, but I have been looking at some of Steichen's landscape pictures, and they're they're really quite beautiful. Um, so that that's beginning to creep in, you know, the looking at that work. Um, what I found uh, problematic is a, a lot of that. I mean, they wanted to be painters. They wanted to say, no, we're better than photographers, you know? So oftentimes it's sentimental and artificial, but some great ones uh, have been made and they're, I mean, Steigen is just my favorite. He's just incredibly astute with uh, just how to mix color and atmosphere uh, and light. I mean, they remind me of Monk a little bit. Wonderful. Are there any other questions? We've been doing rapid fire questions at you. I think everybody. Come on, <laughs> ask something hard. Uh, Helen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I was wondering, um, you've done so many different things and so creatively. I'm just wondering, has there ever been a period of time in your life when you somehow just didn't feel the creativity or just ran into a wall or somehow nothing came to mind and if so how did you work out of that yeah there was a yeah there was a period of my life in the 80s uh where i think i was quite depressed and uh, you know i things were not coming in and and i remember just not wanting to to photograph so much um what what made me come out of it was uh, our, our first son uh, was born in 87, 86. And I thought, okay, I wasn't being recognized. I'm not, not so good anymore. And so-and-so has better grants and, you know, the typical shit. Uh, but playing with him and playing with toys and just taking my time with a light inside the house really brought me out because it set me up to, to you know, just accept normal grace, you know, just um, looking at a bottle of milk was as interesting as photographing the Grand Canyon, you know, so uh, that helped a lot emotionally. Uh, and um, I just, I, I'm working more than I ever have. And maybe it's, I'm 73 now and Maybe some of it is like, shit, what if tomorrow I can't do it anymore? I want to, I want to put them, I want to make a lot. <laughs> so that's the devil sort of behind me or something. But yeah, there was that time when I just, I don't know, I think I was caught up in the whole uh, professionalism of artwork and so and so and who's coming to that opening. And I mean, stuff I obviously don't do that anymore, but you can, you can get caught into that track. Uh, that's why I love living in Boston. I mean, I have a, my galleries in New York, but living in Boston makes me feel a little bit less crazy. So, so Tom, who asked about pictorialism, um, wanted to follow up saying that he agreed about both the pictorialist movement, not great, and Steichen, who is great. Um, but he asks because just like they tried to make photography into something more, your adding of texture from the grass or the dirt or the flowers seemed similar to him. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I just see uh, the extension of the camera obscura into the grass or whatever, just suggests uh, a kind of a evolution of photography. It's who says that photography has to be with a sheet of film in the camera or something, you know? Um, no, it's an experimental attitude that I have. And I'm certainly not trying to make uh, romantic landscapes. I mean, I don't think so, but um, I, I, wanna, I, make, I wanna make freaky things, and, but they happen to be beautiful sometimes. So, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, I can't help it, but it's a good question. Uh, because, you know, uh, it can become a crutch, you know, to 
uh, make photography look uh, so different than that uh, it's left what photography is. Yeah, so it's still important. All right, Heidi wants to know if there's any ideas about what Norway might bring. Well, they have those summers that last forever, you know, all day long. Fjords, where Monk painted, um, painted the light is just kind of amazing. So I want to try to photograph it at night. Um, and just, uh, it's interesting. I, this Cuban born, born in, with a lot of sun and happiness and, you know, like dancing and stuff. Monk, hmm, he's not really a fun guy that we think he is. He's, he was really a, a dark guy, but maybe age is making me look at uh, funny light like that, you know, just dark clouds coming in. And I'm, you know, I'm just not questioning it. You know, uh, I am going to France and then I'm going to Italy, then I'm going to Norway. And uh, I met, uh, the Norwegian ambassador to Estonia. She invited us to a party and she said, you must come to Norway and we will set you up and take you to Monk's house and take you to the northernmost place in, in Norway, which is by the polar circle where light is 24 hours a day. So, wow. Who, see, who can say no to that? Exactly. Yeah, so Norway. I'd love to travel with you. So take me on your next trip. Okay, we will do. Send me a grant. All right, Cindy would like to know, are your children following in your footsteps and pursuing a career in photography? Uh, no, my, my son Brady, he's quite a good painter. I mean, he was doing that for when he was 12 and incredible uh, drawings and paintings and I mean really good and I I certainly could not paint back then uh, so he but now he's he's a he writes scripts for films mm. um, and my daughter uh, works at Conde Nast uh, doing video so you know but the last thing you want to tell your children is like be like me you know Wow, <laughs> they take the opposite route. <laughs> Sounds like they're both in uh, finding their creativity in other ways. Yeah, yeah, and it's fun because uh, I they they talk to me about my art. It's mm -hmm. interesting, and and I think that they're being honest. They're saying this is really good. So I boy, uh, I still got it. <laughs> By the way, I want to have a show of this uh, painting work at the New Bedford, the UMass, uh, what's that campus called? Uh, Dartmouth? You, what is it? Dartmouth. Dartmouth. Yeah. Yeah. My next door neighbor, Anthony Fisher, who's a painter, um, very good painter, and I are going to have a show. And at first I was gonna do photographs and now it's all painting. So it's wow. all paintings. Yeah, I know, very daring. That I'm gonna be running daring. Run out of town, but, and that's gonna be sometime in February, but it's gonna be big, big images, maybe 12 to 15 paintings and, uh, or photographs of paint, as I like to call it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, it was gonna be interesting. I, I'm walking around now, uh, because in photography it's all very clean, with trousers and shirts that are full of paint. <laughs> so I, I now feel like Jackson Pollock. You're a painter now. It's I'm a painter now. <laughs> I got my certificate. Any other questions? Well. That might be the end of the line. Well, thank you. All, I mean, I like, I like questions because it's a way to kind of think mm -hmm. about stuff. And, uh, but I do appreciate, you know, the effort that people make. Uh, and I, I appreciate your fine work behind the show and 
I mean, you, you've been a, a real trooper, uh, very indebted to you. As a closing comment, Andrea says, this was great, thank you. Such a privilege to get the preview of your new work. Can't wait to see them. And the show at FAM is wonderful. Thank you, Andrea. Every exhibition we've seen of your work has been a revelation. So, yes. Um, if we were in person, I think we'd all do a round of applause at this point. Um, but Abe, I would like to thank you so, so much for again, giving us your time, giving us a peek inside your brain, answering all of these questions. It has been an absolute pleasure. Um, I hope everybody comes out to FAM and sees the show if you haven't already um, up through early January, as I mentioned. And um, otherwise, thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a great night.